session, but we left you with a small challenge. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just present a, a possible solution. Again, they are not universal solutions in, in science. So this is one possible one. So the question that we raised to you was, I'll just open the file. Just give me, bear with me one second. By the way, can you hear me well? Is my sound going well okay? Yep. Good. So the challenge was we provided you with this very noisy image. And I said that within this image, there are some hidden patterns and that the hidden patterns are 0.45 microns in length. Uh, and I asked you if you could write a macro to automate the process of, um, oh, I see the poll, I'm gonna put the poll aside. Um, and I asked you if you could uh, basically uh, then apply a scale bar into this image and save the file as a TIFF or PNG, whatever file format you prefer. So again, this is just a possible solution. This is something that I created. So again, I'll just push this aside. So this will be available on the repository so you can actually download this possible solution. So the first thing you have to do is actually create the command to open the image. In this case, these are text images. These are basically CSV files with lots of numbers. So that's why we have to run the text image command. The next thing that we have to do is actually then go through the brightness and contrast mode and try to find the patterns. Because again, we still don't know how many, how big these patterns are in terms of pixels. And although we do know what their real size is, 0.45 microns. So I created this sequence of events. Let's just run the micro and see how this works. So if I press now run, there'll be a window that asks me, where is your file? So in this case, I'm gonna say it's at example four, it's over here. And I created, and I'm gonna put the windows aside so you can see properly. I hope you can also see my mouse. Um, so what we have at the moment, yes, we opened the file, the example four, CSV. We now have the brightness and contrast window open. And I added this line, which I think I mentioned in the, in the last tutorial, which is wait for user, meaning this uh, stops the macro at this point. That, and this allows you to actually go through your image. So you see the histogram of your image. And you see that there's a big drop of pixel intensities towards the, 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 the bigger values. So if I just play with this now, you see that I'm just applying a threshold, which we'll talk about later today. And by doing that, I can now see some dots, which are probably my patterns. So if I now can use the, the magnifying tool, I can zoom into my image. And now I can see that these are the patterns that were hidden. And I don't know if, for, if everyone fill out the poll, but in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the 10, which is really hidden over there. So there were 10 patterns. They were all exactly the same size and they are three pixels in length. So I know now that three pixels equates to 0 0.45 microns. However, the question was apply a scale bar to the original file, not to this hidden uh, threshold image. So now that I found what's the dimension that I'm looking for, I'm not gonna apply this the transformation because this will change the pixel values of my image. I'm just gonna click on okay. And you see that now I revert back to the original, uh, uh, to the original uh, image. And now I can fill out this form. So I have three pixels. I know that this is 045 and I know that the unit is microns, okay? So I did my, uh, inquisitive detective role. So now I can apply this uh, skill to the image. And as oh, this was very fast because it's again, a sequence of events. So we, uh, is now already asked me to save the file. But what, if you notice here at the image, now we have not pixels, but we actually have dimensions. Oh yes. So it's a 38 by 38 by 38 micron uh, image. And now I can save this as a PNG and I'm gonna save it in the desktop it doesn't really matter where. And just again, to reinforce the idea, this was defined over here. So we set up the skill. This is the way you put input the, 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 the size of the pixels. And then I just apply the five micron skill. Again, as you, if you go through the code, you see that there are many, many uh, specifications here in the scale bar. And here I said that I want a five micron um, uh, scale bar, but I can change this to two, to one, I mean, it doesn't really matter. You can pick whatever you want. And I can also, if you see here, the image ha has no numbers. If I remove this hide, 
uh, command. And now I just rerun the macro again. And again, uh, I'll just go quick because I don't know the size. So it's three zero forty five. Oops, apologize. And it's microns. And now you see that just by making that small modification, I can now see the. Uh, yes, I'll replace it. I can now see the number of my scale bar. So again, this is a possible solution for the for the homework. If you come up with other solutions, that's great. I mean, we can always discuss them later if you want. Uh, but again, this just gives you a nice flavor for what macros can do for you. Uh, again, this is just a very basic one uh, with the knowledge that we tried to impart to you on the previous session. Uh, there are many more things that you can do with these kind of uh, macro uh, languages. Okay. So if there are no questions, I'm going to stop now and give, uh, pass on the, the word to Yarden, I believe, or to Sam, sorry. Yarden's up next, you're correct. So Yarden is going to just go through a little bit of background information um, about what we're going to be covering uh, in the session today, and then we'll, we'll start into the actual tutorial portion. Were there any questions? Not really, right? Just want to make sure of that because I saw. Uh, there's no questions in the Q&A and chat, but feel free to throw them in if you have questions for anything Joao has done. Um, did anyone did the homework? That's also, uh, you know, in the poll. There were a couple people, answers? there a couple folk, it looked like, completed the poll saying they completed the homework. So oh, OK, OK. Did they get, okay, did they get the right good. number? Did they get the right number of factors? <laughs> yeah, there, there was a right number. So that, that OK. It, very good, very yeah. Good. Nice, nice, nice. Congratulations, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm I'm not seeing anything come in. So Yarden, if you want to begin, perfect. Let me just start. Um, one second. Okay, can everybody see this? Is that does that look good? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'm just gonna go over a little bit of the theory, and you guys again feel free to drop some questions in the Q and A if they come along as, as we're going through this, or if I'm going too fast or too slow, feel free to just <laughs> let me know. Um, so let's just start. Um, we'll start with the very basics. I think uh, this was mentioned a little bit in the uh, previous tutorial, but kind of just to bring you back as to like, what is an image? So basically an image, as you know, is a 2D array. Um, so it could be, pixels and then each pixel has some sort of pixel value. Um, and basically as in digital image processing, what you're doing is you, you're you looking at those pixels and you can manipulate them in different forms. Um, and it's kind of important to know that there's also pixel co coordinates. So you can kind of think of it as kind of like a 2D matrix or a 2D array um, where it's just X of N, Y of N. So one, one, two, one, three, one, et cetera. So let's say I'm talking about the pixel that's 255 in the center. Uh, I look here and I can see that, okay, that's uh, pixel coordinate three, three. Um, so what we'll be going over it in today's kind of quick uh, summary is uh, basic image operation. So we'll be looking at thresholding, uh, some logical operations, as well as convolution and filtering. Um, so what is thresholding? Thresholding is one of the simplest forms of image segmentation, which image segmentation, as the name suggests, is a process which um, we segment the image into different segments. So we're looking at different parts of the image. Um, so in thresholding, uh, we change the pixels of an image to make it, the image easier to analyze. So a lot of the times this is done in the grayscale. Um, and we kind of take the image, we grayscale it and kind of binarize the image where um, this can kind of be seen as a piecewise function where you have some sort of thresholded value uh, where anything above or below it is one and anything else is zero. Um, so one way of thresholding is through the histogram. So here's an example of something that's a single threshold. So everything, um, below this is zero and above this is one. Uh, and you can also have it where it's a dual threshold. You can do um, kind of multiple segments, but that, that that's a bit more complicated and we won't be looking at that. There's also entropy, clustering, spatial, and a bunch of other different types of thresholding. Uh, but I believe what we'll be looking at today is mostly histogram. Um, so we'll be going through a couple of thresholding met methods. So we have Oates's method, which basically 
searches for a threshold that minimizes the interclass variance, um, which is defined by a weighted sum. Basically, there's two classes. You have background and foreground. So that's, again, going back to the single threshold. One part of the image is the background, as you can see here, and then one is the foreground. Uh, there's the ISO method, uh, which also searches for intensities that separate the image into two groups, similar to the background and foreground. Um, where the, but this way, uh, here, the threshold intensity is midway between the mean intensities. So you can see the example as well here. And then Yen's thresholding method, which is kind of uses multi-level thresholds um, based on the maximum correlation criteria. And there's a lot of also like cost function analysis in Yen's method. And that's kind of, it, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but there's also um, in the link here, um, if you follow this reference, there's um, a good page that shows all the different methods um, as well as links to their papers if you want to know more about them. Um, so next, after thresholding, we have also logical operators. So let's say you have two original images. Uh, this is just a binary image, so 0 and 1, um, x and y. And the most basic function logical operator uh, is the not. So I'm sure if you've done a little bit of programming, you're used to maybe using if it's x, then like not x, then it's y or something, do, do this. So the not is very simple. <laughs> if it's if x is one, it becomes zero, and if x is zero, it becomes one. So we can also look at if it's true, then flip it to false, and if it's false, flip it to true. And you can kind of see that these images have now been inverted, where um, the zero is now one, and one is zero. Uh, there's also the and function, um, which is basically saying that um, only include the ones that are similar. So you can see that. They only if you x and and y, uh, then the only part that they overlap is this little circle here, and that's what you get from the image. Um, there's the or, which is basically if it's x or y, then that's when you create that part of the image. Um, and then the exclusive or, which is basically uh, it can be used as a modulo modulo two operator as well as basically like the name says exclusively. So it can be one or zero, but it can't be both. So you can see here that it's kind of, there's that gap here where uh, you X, X, X or Y. Um, next we'll talk about convolution. So uh, convolution is basically the process of transforming an image by applying a kernel <clears throat> over each pixel and its local neighbors uh, across the entire image. So, um, the kernel is a matrix of values whose size and values determine the transformation effect. So you basically have some sort of kernel, a filter kernel, and then it's convolved with the original image, which gives you that convolved image. And you can do multiple things with it. There's edge detection, smoothing, blurring, and that's really what we're using those filters for. Um, so here we have some sort of original image where the pixel values here, you can see there's just that white what image. Um, and let's say we have something like the identity kernel, which will keep it the same. So um, if you've done any sort of math courses before, I'm sure you know about the identity matrix, um, the kernel is very similar. Um, so there's three steps. Um, you place the kernel matrix over each pixel of the image. Um, so you're kind of going through um, for each part of the image. And then the sum of the resulting multiplied values, and then the resulting value is the new center pixel. So you can see here, this is selected. Um, but again, we're using the identity. So really what this is doing is everything else is zero and we're keeping that middle value the same. Um, so you just kind of work your way through looking at each center pixel as you move along. And you can build the image like that that becomes your filtered image. Um, so now what happens if there's edges? Um, edges can be very complex and complicated. Um, Fiji basically just assumes that uh, anything absent is just has the kernel value of zero. Um, and in Python, it's pretty function dependent. If you're interested in, um, so in some functions in Python, you have 
the option to actually put in some sort of edge um, edge filter or edge mask, um, and some of them will do it for you. So make sure that if you're using it and it's something that's important, the edges are something important for you um, to know what the function is actually doing because it's it's very function dependent. So as like we did with the identity kernel, you can see that the image here is actually unchanged. Uh, there's other kernels. So here we're looking at the mean kernel, which is essentially just the average and what happens when you average it out going pixel by pixel, you just kind of enlarge the area becomes gray. So it's pretty simple and intuitive and it's a way of smoothing your image. Um, yeah, smoothing and reducing noise, sorry. Um, so here's just the mean kernel again, if we were to move uh, this, let's say we can look at, the, at this as kind of noise, uh, move that to a different part. You can see that it kind of gets smoothed and almost kind of disappears. Uh, but these are obviously the, the extreme cases. We also have the median kernel, um, which is, again, it's you're taking the median of the neighboring uh, pixels. So when you're doing that here, you actually end up getting that um, that white dot disappears. So again, it's another way to reduce noise and it's uh, similar to the mean filter, but it, it does a better way of preserving that image. Uh, you also have the Gaussian blur, uh, which from the name, you can kind of guess that it is used to kind of blur the image. Um, and if you're familiar with the Gaussian function, it is kind of like a little bell shape and you'll notice that it's also similar that way in the kernel itself. Um, another thing that I forgot to mention was that the Kernels don't have to be three by three. They are here in this case where we're doing three by three just because it's easier to kind of show the changes um, with the pixel values. Uh, but again, the Gaussian blur um, could be three by three, five by five, seven by seven, et cetera. Um, the kernel doesn't always have to be three by three. It's, it's, <laughs> it's whatever you need it to be. Um, next, we have the Sobel filter, which is actually used for edge detection. Um, and you're kind of, it's it's you'll notice that it's similar to the Gaussian if you, we look back at the Gaussian here. Um, so it's basically just doing some sort of edge detection using the Gaussian also to implement a little bit of blurring. Um, and it, it's really useful in finding um, the the gradient. So um, sorry, my microphone died. So yeah, you can use it. It's it's mostly used for edge detection and you can also use it to find, um, it's nice because you can also use uh, the angle, um, use it to find the angle of the edge. So here we've just taken the horizontal Sobel filter and you can see here that there's a huge change. Um, we're going from um, completely black to completely white. So. Um, if you run that Sobel filter across at the horizontal Sobel filter, it'll it'll detect those changes in those two lines, and you'll notice that um, you can see an edge there. Um, so if you're looking at it kind of from an image perspective, you can also see here if we look at some coins, it has now found the edges of just those coins. Uh, we also have the Laplacian of the Ga of Gaussian, uh, which is another form of edge detection. Um, but this time it's using uh, the second spatial derivative of an image. Um, so another big thing to look at is um, you'll notice that even for the Sobel, what they do is you actually want to smooth out the image before you're thresholding. And this is, here's a good example of it. If we look here, uh, the first image here, A, um, there's a bunch of noise. And if you convert it to a grayscale and you look at the histogram, it's like you can't really see what your two foreground and background is. Um, and so what happens is the filter won't be as strong and you'll get a lot of noise and you won't be able to separate your foreground and background, which is what you're basically trying to do. Um, so here what they've done uh, in D, the bottom one, is what they've actually done is they've applied a Gaussian and smoothed it before. And you can see how much better the peaks are. It's you could you could just look at looking at this, you could tell what 
you know, what's the foreground and what's the background. And so that really helps f those kernels and filters um, segment the two images. So here again, you can see it's much easier to see uh, the two the two images there. Um, and so that's basically it. Um, I'll pass it over to Alex, where he'll kind of actually implement these in Python. And then I believe Joe Ah will imp implement them in uh, Fiji. Uh, and then uh, we'll go back and kind of talk about the homework. Thank you. OK. Are there any like uh, like questions? Like we will go through this. Like this was just like the introduction of the the concept. Like very very brief introduction of the concept we're gonna go through. Uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna wait like one minute to see like there is some question popping up. Maybe Sam will have some. Yeah, I'm not seeing any yet. So Alex, maybe okay. if you wanna um, just start sharing your screen and, and talking about getting things started, and then if Absolutely. anyone has yeah, yeah, questions. Yeah. Feel we free to right speak now. up or put it in the Q&A. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. We're going to just start, the, start the, the binder. So this is the way we did it last time on the first tutorial. Uh, so we're going to go through the um, uh, TCM tutorial uh -huh, uh, link that I, has been sent in the chat. If you have it, so I'm going to just go slowly. Let you run join. So you should see this page. And so once you're there, I'm going to ask you to click on this little button learn to launch the binder. And uh, you will see some stuff is going to be happening. And we're going to wait that everybody really sees the same screen as what I am seeing here. So let's go. Thumbs up or, or a sign when you, when you, yeah, just, just like make a sign to go that we are ready to go. And in the meantime, I got to be discussing. So um, the, so today, the, so on the first tutorial, we are looking how to visualize the data. So the idea was to say, we don't modify anything about the data. We just want to see what is inside. Now today, we're going to do something different where we're going to ma manipulate the data, change a little bit the data for a certain purpose. So here, we want to go to what we, uh, like mainly call, call it like particle counting, particle characterization. So this is where you have like a similar features on your entire image and you just want like an automated way of characterizing them. The size, their, I don't know, centroid, perimeter, whatever you want. Uh, so the idea would be, okay, I have a, a certain type of data. I want to modify it in some sense to be going through the packages that already existed uh, for that purpose. And that will be the world goal of today. We will go through like some filtering aspect so the filtering will be just in the idea of denoising because like no, always have some noise in your data. Then the next will be thresholding, separate the background from your features. And then at the end, the last part will be what we call like segmentation or labeling, which will be based on this separated data to uh, then after find some characteristics of them. So this is still going through. Let me hope it's gonna be okay. The first roll often takes some time. Then after it should be rolling better. I'm just gonna check because maybe I have some another one open that I didn't see. Oh, I have another one that is open, so I'm gonna close it actually to not have an overlap. Okay, what is happening? <laughs> Does anyone manage to get there? Any thumbs up or is everyone still spinning? Nope, some some folk have got it. Joao's in, Farzan is in. Oh, I have a question. Oh, Alana, Anna, were you able to get in? Okay, let me try it again. I don't know what happened. I'm gonna just try to start it again. See, just hope that everybody can go there. 
graph is going to just say the same. Okay, it's going there. Don't know what happened. That's okay. Oh, we okay. have a what? Oh, no, hand down. Okay, never mind. Sorry, I thought someone had a question. Okay, so like once there, you go to tutorial two and you just start the CCM notebook. And we should be all here. Can I wait a little bit? So in this notebook, there are going to be some blank cells, and we're going to fill them back together to go through. We will be using some knowledge that the, from the tutorial one and some additional knowledge like from the specifics of today's tutorial. Um, so um, I guess just like wait, is everybody on this page? Like, can I just get like some hands up or just message to know if you are on this page? Okay. And from the attendees? Yep, uh, we've got some yeses. Okay, um, if it's not working, feel free to stop us. Uh, yeah. Because the idea is that we all go together. So if it's going there, uh, we're gonna run this first one. So this exactly this, as the same as the tutorial one, we're gonna download the packages that are missing. Uh, because in on the, the binder, there's a, a preset of packages available. Sometimes you might not have the one that we are using. And I'm uh, gonna just introduce the, the packages we're gonna be using. Uh, these are the one, okay, so I'm gonna just let it go. To not have to go down every two seconds. Okay, and then you can run this one once it's finished. Okay, so the first four one, that is the one that we use in tutorial one. So you are familiar with them, a NumPy to uh, like, the, oh, Alex. Great. Yes. Just a quick question. Could you yep. just slow down a little? Absolutely. <laughs> I will. Uh, so the two, the two um, other one here were for visualization of data. So we we will not use the scale bar today, but I just wanted to put the same uh, um, packages that we used it previously. And uh, this one is Imageio is to uh, read or save. Uh, data as images. Here are the new ones that we're going to be using today. So uh, SciPy, which is uh, so here actually we have some documentation here. We can just go there at the same time. I just up here SciPy, Scikit image. These are the two ones. So sorry, I have my annotation bar there that I'm going to remove. Uh, these are the uh, the two packages. So scientific Python, a uh, lots of uh, functions there available to do that. So not only image processing. This is like for scientific Python in general. And uh, we have Scikit image that is dedicated for image processing, and we, this is the one that we're going to be using the most uh, uh, today. Uh, so here are the three the three ones we're going to be using: this module filters and the module measure. Um, this one here that you have is one that is included in, in the also Scikit. It is just a specific color map. You will see when it happens. Sometimes the color map provided already are not enough to represent the data. And the last one here, this is just an introduction to the uh, mask array that uh, a specific module in NumPy uh, that is very interesting to manipulate like the data itself and have a mask that you and then have to apply on it. So we will not go through all the details of that, but you, you will see like the you will feel like the power behind it be, be, behind it. Okay, so uh, from there, if we go, we're gonna just go through this little uh, function to say that we are in the notebook mode for the plotting to work well. And now we're gonna load our data. So finally, we are starting. Uh, so we're gonna use the, the this O3 setup up file. So this is uh, um, like the file, this file is a TEM data. So this is gonna represent those uh, silica particles that you just saw in the presentation. Um, you can also apply the same uh, notebook with the blobs.diff. This is the, the, the image that is available in Fiji. It works very well and actually works even too nicely, in my opinion. So that's why we decided to go to this TM example uh, to have like something that is more representative. So we're going to go here and we're going to use Image.io. That's all. just to remember like what we do, the way we imported it. Uh, so we, we imported Image.io as uh, IO, so we're going to do IO, I'm read. 
and we're going to put this file name here that we got here and let's just bring this data let's see how what we have this is what we got um so something here is kind of shocking us we are expecting to have something like a 2d array and this doesn't look like a 2d array so just to have an idea we're gonna just change instead of printing the data we can for example print the shape of this data and this is what we got we have uh, actually a three-dimensional array 248 by 248 by three so this data that you have here is actually not the raw data that has been collected on the um, uh, like directly from the microscope this has been saved as a display and when you do that uh, the data is saved as an RGB file and each channel of the RGB will be part of this uh, three channels that you see here. And this is not what you, what we want. Like we want to have this two dimensional array with just like to be able to navigate through the different pixels uh, uh, of the array. So just to highlight this, uh, we're going to just add a cell below here and we're going to print some data of this array just to have a, a visual. So for example, we can see if we see data of here, this is going to be the element of the array, zero, zero, zero. So this, here, I'm going to be navigating through this three-dimensional array, which is a bit like weird at the moment. We're going to get a results. This results is the intensity of the peaks of the of the element at the at the co at the coordinates of the array of the index of the array zero zero zero. If you print, for example, data zero for the same location, but all the three channels here. You would realize that they have exactly the same intensity. And that's the, the 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 case when you have an RGB image that is grayscale that have exactly the same number in the channel. So in that case, when it happens, it means that we don't care what is in each of the RGB channel there. We're gonna just take a subset of this to come back to to the array, and we're gonna make. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna make a new cell. There is a. Uh, I think to go faster. So here we're gonna do this, okay? And how to just extract a section of the data? Sorry, uh, when you have like a, an empire array, we're gonna say I want to take all the data. This double dot is all the data from the first uh, dimension, all the data from the second dimension, and only take, for example, the first element of the third dimension. So let's do this. And I'm gonna we're gonna just now visualize. NumPy print NumPy shape of image. Okay, and now we have like something 2048 by 2048, something that looks like a two dimensional array with a number of pixel in X and Y direction. Okay, so the reason I'm just showing this is that this happened many times where the data has not been saved as raw data. You have a display, you have no metadata, for example, in, the, in this case. Uh, and you want still to be able to do something from this data. So it's possible. You just need to look at and what is inside and came to the case where you want to apply your filtering or any other type of processing. So now we have the data that is in a certain shape. We can now visualize it to see how it looks like quickly. So let's do our uh, matplotlib you use our matplotlib library for that. So we will use the same thing as what we learned on the first tutorial. So we're going to first initiate like the figure. Then we're going to do initiate the axis inside the figure. So fig add the plot. So we're going to put one, one, one because we're going to just put one axis on that figure. And we're going to use the function imshow of that image. So here I anticipate I'm going to just put the color map already there. And we will plot show. Run the thing. And this is what we get. Okay. So I just, um, I'm going to just like just for the sake of the example. So here we have like the, the our nanoparticles. We can see, like, if you can see my mouse, you can navigate through the data. And you should see on the bottom right here, you have the coordinate xy and the intensity value that, that is there. So here, something like 144, here 96. So Matplotlib is also able to plot RGB files, just like for the sake of just showing 
what was happening if you were showing the data directly without doing this. And let's see what this looks like. You will see that it looks identical. That's what we expected. But if you now check in the values here, you can see on the bottom right here, uh, you will have like the, all the RGB channel having exactly the same numbers. This is the case when you have a grayscale image. Okay, so we don't want to work on this 3D data set. We're gonna work on our 2D data set. This is how it looks like. And now the, the, the idea, okay, we have those particles. They are, some of them are separated. Some of them are overlapping. But the idea is say, okay, I want just to characterize the process I have I've been here. And I just want to have like the size distribution or the area distribution uh, of my process. And this is the type of data uh, I get. So how can I do it uh, in an automated or I would say, uh, reliable manner because of course you can go manually and trying to do it you know like uh, uh, trying to measure the diameter by hand but it's going to be a really tedious task and maybe not as reliable as what we uh, we may think so let's try here to develop this methodology that has been de developed like in the in the scikit image library uh, to automate that and be transparent on what we are doing so uh, I, just for the sake of this um, memory here, so depending what are your limitations, uh, uh, I will stop here at the interactivity of the plot. Uh, so because like for uh, this, you can, for example, zoom in, the, move it. Uh, but this is taking some memory. So if you click on that little knob, then after you lose your interactivity of the plot. Now it's frozen, but taking less memory. Okay, so we will now start with the Gaussian smoothing. So. Uh, this will be the first step uh, of the of the processing, and the idea here is that we have some noise in this data, as has been shown before. The noise will have some problems when we are doing the thresholding uh, part because, uh, like, th there will be some part of the threshold that will go to the background and some in the in the foreground uh, from the noise contribution, and we want to not have the noise in that. We just only want to have the the signal from the from the particle. So here we're going to implement those Gaussians manually. We will see then after that we can use the packages that already existed, but it's just to show that with Python, you can do whatever you want, design the kernel you want, do the operation that you want. Uh, it's uh, really okay. So what is happening? Do you want to, this is actually open and save it. Do you want to override the file? I don't want, I want just to continue. <laughs> okay. Hope you didn't get those message, <laughs> error message. We'll see if it works. Um, so let's start by the first implementing the kernel, and we will do a three by three Gaussian kernel that's been introduced in the in the previous presentation. So we're gonna use the the NumPy function to do that, and simply as that, we're gonna just create an array. Okay, so since it's a two dimensional array, I'm gonna just do it like closely. So if you do one bracket, this we're gonna make a one dimension. If you put a second bracket like that, it means that you will start a two dimension. The more bracket you put, the more the more dimensions you add. And here we're going to be writing like the elements of the kernel. And uh, so here for the visual, I, I'm going to just um, redo the, the the array just for the visual part. But you can write it in one line if you want to. And we're going to put the elements in each one. So one, two, one. If I recall well, then here it's going to be uh, two, four, one. And I should put this thing here, and then the last row which will be one to one. So we create our three by three kernel by in it, really putting the value of the pixels that you want. Okay, so we can we can just print it like if you want just to be sure. But like, and one thing also, if you press tab two times, it will autofill, or ask you like the some proposition to autofill the, for example, the variables or the functions. So Nomia is not defined yet, sure, because I do it two times, sorry. <laughs> okay, so we have our kernel, a three by three uh, uh, array. Okay, I don't know what you want from me, but we will do it later. And since if like uh, now, if you take the integral of that kernel here, this is not normalized. So you will modify the data, like the scale of the data. So you will gonna just normalize by dividing by the sum of each pixel here. So you could do it manually, but again, NumPy is offering some options of doing this automatically. So we're gonna just call our Gaussian. 
to the Gaussian three by three, and we're gonna just divide by the NumPy sum of the Gaussian kernel, oops, three by three. NumPy sum is just taking the sum of each element of the array. It doesn't consider the dimension, just flatten everything and just and, and calculate it. And you can print it just for the sake of taking everything going away. Let's go. And that's our Gaussian kernel. Okay. So the role of this kernel will be so to blur the image, okay, but with by also blurring the noise. So in this case, we might degrade the resolution that what we see uh, the, uh, of the image, but we will gain in reducing the, no the component of noise. So we can apply here our convolution process. So it's possible to code it by yourself, do like the so like the, the product of the sum of each pixel. Here again, we're gonna use a library. There are many libraries that you can use. NumPy can do it, SciPy can do it. So here I just, just to introduce the, 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 the um, uh, SciPy library, I just would like to use this convolve 2D function. Can I just call it convolve? Yes, SciPy signal convolve 2D. And here you will see convolve two dimensional arrays, one, two. So the, the notion here of 2D will, uh, will uh, uh, impose some condition on the, on the inputs. So like for us should have the same number of dimensions as uh, input one. You have here some elements here, boundary field, field values. This is what uh, Jordan was talking about. Those are the uh, um, options that you can add that are here function dependent. Uh, that will change, for example, the behavior on the board or, or um, uh, other aspect of the convolution. I don't want to go too much into the detail. We're going to just let the default uh, uh, values here because like the, the, the edges of the entire image is going to be minimal in our 2048 by 2048 case. But like for sure, you can here go a little bit more in detail and, and, uh, and decide what, uh, what you want to do. We're gonna just go through the through the Alex, There's yes. one question and it's been uploaded. Yes. Um, should the second row be two four two? Two yes, oh nice catch. Absolutely nice catch. Actually, I'm not sure we could have it, we would yeah. haven't spotted so much of a difference like uh, on that. But uh, that, that's that's uh, technically yes, the Gaussian is two four two. <laughs> nice catch. Um uh, but actually, we can even try with the with the one. You will see like it is, is gonna work. Uh, so just to check how we call the SciPy signal. So import SciPy dot signal i signal. So we're gonna just call signal right away. Signal dot convolve again. If you do the tab one, you will see that they are the, what is proposing me. They are the functions of the library. Uh, and convolve to the and we will just go okay I want my original image so I think it's called image is it that image yes and uh, go from kernel three by three normalized I wanted to put the normalized oops I wanted just to okay well we can plot it right away uh yeah I don't know why I have this okay One more question about sure. the Gaussian. Is the Gaussian kernel always with these particular values or would multiple of these values produce the same thing? So like multiples of these values shouldn't change like in the amplitude since it's normalized afterwards. So uh, any multiple which the same, but there is no point of putting the multiples, especially if you norm normalize it afterwards. So this will be just an amplitude in front of it that will be removed in the normalization process. Uh, add, sorry, add the plot. Image show, same thing of, um, oh, actually, yes, that the, was the, the, the idea. We were gonna do two axes. We're gonna have both of, of them. So remember how we were doing, like we're gonna have multiple axes, so axe one and axe two. And the idea is to use the add subplot function to arrange our axis, number of row, number of column, and then index one to two. So one row, two column, from the axis number one, one column, one row, two column, 
uh, index number two. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing as what we did last time. We're gonna share the same uh, axis. That means that when we zoom or move on the, on, on the images, we move in parallel uh, in, on both axes. Okay, so we're gonna do this. We did that last time on the on the tutorial, and uh, so and we're gonna do x one im show of our image again map equal gray. Same thing for x two, but now we're gonna show our um, image smooth. Okay. I am worried to reload and have to start everything. So that's why I'm not gonna <laughs> keep doing this cancel. I'm sorry for that. If so, I may just do it with the team. Okay, and then plot. So let's go. Uh, Axe 2 is not defined. Uh, what did I do? Yes, nice mistakes here. Like I didn't define this here, so I won't be, have any chance of being there. Okay, this is what we have. And uh, so we need like, if we look at just by like far away, it's difficult like to notice any changes. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit and I'm gonna advise to zoom on the area where we have like a little bit of the background and the uh, and first edges here of the, of the particles. This will be better to appreciate. And that's ex so the, and you can see here so it's again not that easy to see because it's uh it's like we, we are only doing like a very small kernel of about three by, by three but you can just by eye we're gonna find like some other metrics see that there are like some differences here if you look at the background we see we seems that the, the the noise on the background seems to be a little bit diminished and here we can also see that near the edges it looks a little bit more blurry so this is like here, the, we use this filtering like to remove the noise, but at the cost of blurring a little bit our image. Okay, so this is what we wanted to do. And we will see, especially more in the, in the Fiji demo, that is much more visual on that. You will see like the effect, uh, more the effect of this filtering of why the image on the right is way better to treasure than the one on the left. Okay, any questions here? Are we on the same pace? Is it okay? to everything in the Q&A. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand or, or just put them in the chat or Q&A. Um, I don't see any, so I'm assuming we're good. Okay. Okay. I let some time like for to be sure that people have time to type. So like the, just the, the next here, uh, so I left sometimes some empty slides like, uh, cells like that just to, to not see what is the next step because sometimes in the next step there is the solution of the previous one. So they, they're gonna still be blanked. In the solution, they, re, they, they are removed. Um, so, and here, this is just like uh, on the next, uh, uh, this will be the same Gaussian kernel that we apply, but instead of applying by three by three, we're gonna apply it by five by five. So in, in, that, in that case here, it won't change that much. Uh, but just like the message was here is that you, you are not required to use a three by three uh, kernel to, to make it. You can use like whatever you want as the other uh, shown in the, in the presentation. And um, uh, yeah, that was like uh, the curiosity. Like if, for example, we put this one, I would just come back on that because it was actually a nice suggestion to see how it will look like if we have screwed up that number, I'm pretty sure it won't be that different. So it won't be exactly a Gaussian filter, but I still think that we will get some gain of that. So we will have again, like the noise that is a little bit removed, is still a, a blurry image on the right, uh, because like the effect of changing one value only on that, like it doesn't necessarily change drastically the behavior of that filter right now. So, like that's a good case where a small mistake doesn't have big consequences. Uh, but technically by doing this, you're not doing a Gaussian filter. So uh, like it's better to, oops. What happened? Okay. This is where it's changing me, my cell into markdown. I want this to be in code. Probably used a shortcut key. Let's just come back to this in our original case. 
Oh, I think there is a, a question. Joao, you have a question or a comment? I just have a quick comment. Um, yeah. I just want to stress that these are discrete approximations to the Gaussian uh, function, right? So mathematically, it's a very good approximation, the three by three or five by five. But if you're dealing with mathematicians, they'll tell that it's not the continuum uh, kernel like the Gaussian function is. So, but these are the best approximations that we can apply to our uh, matrix, to our two-day arrays. Keep going, Alex, doing great. Yeah, yeah, and that's, but that's a very good comment, yeah. So again, I'm gonna stop here the interactivity for the memory sake uh, and just show like this, the example. So here it's been already filled, like to not spend time filling a five by five uh, kernel. This will be exactly the same process as we went through. We apply the kernel, we uh, do the convolution and we just plot the data. And in that case, if we compare them to each other, there won't be that much difference between the three by three and the five by five. In, in that case, it's not like a big of a difference. This is but a good was... time to answer oh. this question, Alex. Um, yeah. Can you, while you have these images up, could you just comment then on why the practical advantage of using with one of like the three by three or five versus five? So I pers in that specific case, I don't see anything, any advantage of, for, for using the Gaussian I, uh, uh, in that specific case. Then after it depends on the filter you are using. So if you use like a, a filter that only need the three by three that can be represented in the three by three, do it on the smallest that you can. But some filters might need to be represented on the 10 by 10 uh, pixel, depending. So this becomes very custom. So it could happen that you will need to, but often what you want to do is to have the smaller kernel possible and the, the, to, to represent like uh, the, the, the um, convolution process that you want to apply. Uh, then sometimes you want to convolve two images that are you know 248 by 248. So this happens. In that specific case, I don't think there is any advantage. I just wanted to show that you can do it uh, because every, like you have the, 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 the advantage of, of customizing everything you want by uh, coding, uh, but sometimes it's not necessary. So maybe there will be like some uh, deep, like, you know, more deeper consequences of that, but I would not be aware of, like maybe like in the implementation on the coding side or the mathematical operation, maybe, but like for our application as like microscopist, we will not see that much of a difference in that case. Um, so and this will jump then after on, on the similar topic is that, okay, here we wrote the kernel, we do the convolution and everything, but to be honest, there are already packages that are available to do that. Uh, and that's why we're going to be using them. Uh, so if we go to the uh, scikit library and we go with the filter module, you will see that those filters are already implemented. So you don't even, in, even need to spend time in, in developing the kernels and everything. You will have like a list here. So here we have, for example, the Sobel that we just uh, talked about. I don't know if I can zoom in, can I? Yes. But you have the, the, the Sobel we talked about, like we have the threshold here that we're going to be using later, Wiener Windows. So honestly, like in most of our cases, we can only use the one that are there. And we see that we have the Gaussian filter here. So we're going to have a, a, a round here. So you put your image. Here will be your sigma. So this will be like the, your broadening of your, uh, uh, of your Gaussian. So we will be, uh, we can play a little bit on that. Again, a set of parameters that you can put. Uh, so again, could be read in the detailed documentation. There is one maybe of more interest that I'm gonna just comment here is this preserve, preserve range. If you let it by default, which is false, if you go and see the, so if true, you keep the original variable uh, range of values, else it normalizes everything between zero and one. Uh, so depending on what we are doing, you might say, okay, I prefer to have everything normalized uh, uh, and continue the processing like that. For the case today, we're gonna just try to not uh, change that and keep the original values. So we're gonna apply that function and see like uh, if this Gaussian filtering like applies. So we're gonna use, again, we check how we imported the sky image, the scikit image, sorry, not sky, <laughs> the scikit image uh, filters. So we import sky image dot filters as filters. So we can use filters right away. And uh, here, so filters, then dot. If you start this, you will have like the proposition Gaussian. We're gonna put our image. And here we're gonna use, so sigma one, sigma equal one pixel, if I recall one, and we're gonna just add this preserve. I forgot 
what was preserved range equal true. Okay, it's gonna do something. And here we're gonna plot again. I'm gonna just show you a little faster way of doing like if you want just to do a quick visualization with just like one feed one axe. So you do fig with the comma axe, we just call it like fixed plots. And you can do go right away because the axes are already de defined. So you can do axe and show. And uh, here we want to show image smooth sigma one row sigma gray and plot show. Uh, did I call it correctly? No, it's the two W. Hopla. Apparently, there is an error also on the first one. X subplots. Did I? Did I? Did I? Oh, it's because it's not figured. I'm stupid. <laughs> I call it fig. That fig is not defined. It was plot from my plot. Field. Okay, let's go. And we're gonna go through here, and you will see that yeah, we are coming back to this um, noise that is uh, diminished, and also like the image becoming more blurry. So this is doing the same thing as what we did as our three by three kernel. Um, so I will uh, just go to the next set because this is just applying the same filter with different uh, sigma values, uh, and then we will stop on the on the on the final plot. Like if we, there will be any questions, but these are just like the same smooth thing with different sigmas. And also what is interesting is that this sigma, you can uh, also have different sigma in horizontal and vertical direction. So this is here, so two pixel for pixel. This is um, a zero two, so zero horizontally, two vertically, and uh, five two, like you can, these were implemented in the in the functions. So we're gonna just run them. And here, this is just like gonna be a three by three plots where with the, all the uh, different cases and this is again the same uh, function that we just saw before, plots, uh, plots, subplots, three row, three columns. The, we're gonna share the X and share Y to be moving in the all axes in the same manner. And this is the figure size in inch, if I recall the nine by nine. And here you will have the index, which will be row and column. So you just call your axis, row, column, dot im show, and you put all the different images that we want to see. And we can run that. Wait a bit. If it shows, yes, let's go. And do the same thing. That's what we did. We're going to zoom in uh, this uh, upper right corner. It is very slow, but that's OK. OK, and here you will see. So on the first uh, on the first column, you have like the our uh, uh, custom, like you, the, the kernel we implemented. So the three by three and the five by five. Uh, on the right, you will have like a uniform uh, Gaussian with one pixel, two pixel, four pixel. So you see clearly like the, the blurring that is appearing. And uh, on the right, you will have a zero by two, a two by zero. So you will see that the blurring change of direction. And the last one is five by two, like just to sort of show, so like a kind of an extreme examples. And so here you have you, you have it like you have those filters that are already implemented, and you can use it right away without the need of impl implementing those Gaussian kernels. So the the interesting part of developing the the like implementing the kernel yourself is that you when you have a custom kernel that is not part of this uh, filter list, and which is you know already there are already a lot. Probably we can cover like eighty percent of the cases with those filters that already exist. Okay, any any questions here? Is it okay? Are we on the same page? We have a question. Um, in the previous part, I got this error. Type error cannot unpack non-iterable axes subplot object. Yep. That's, that's the error I got. This is where you, uh, it was uh, this, where you call it here, instead of, if you call it fig, instead of plot. But fig has not been defined. Well, it has been defined in one of the previous cells. But the problem is that uh, you want to actually define fig. So you need to use plot, which is the the what we imported from my plot lit by plot. This. 
probably this is the because we came on the same problem. Okay. I think that's good, Alex. Um, if you okay. want it. So let's go. Uh, so here, like the, just to visualize the um, the the effect of like the noise removal, uh, I will here proposing like to make the histograms of some of the of the uh, of the cases like we 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 just uh, looked at. So for example, we can do like the, the histogram of the image. So if you want to do an histogram, you have to flatten your uh, to the image to be a 1D. This is the requirement for the histogram. You put the number of bins. And uh, here we're gonna we just put a label that we're gonna call it image. Okay, we will, and we will repeat this histogram for, let's say, I don't know, four different cases. So let's take our um, three by three, smooth three by three, okay, smooth. I'm gonna do a hit tab, three by three, for example. Uh, let's here put the smooth, uh, this, for example, pixel two and smooth pixel four. And then we're gonna change, uh, okay, we can change like the label to have like three by three, smooth sigma two. Put my four. Plot it. Okay, this is how it looks like. So uh, we have like the, the the those histogram plots that we did the, from all the different cases. As you can see, they overlap with each other, so they are not easy to read. You have a nice trick here that you can use, which is what we call the alpha, correspond to the transparency. So let's put, for example, 0.5 as a transparency for each of the cases here, you copy paste in each line, and we redo the plot. Okay, and this is how it looks like. So you see on the back, you have the first plot uh, the, the or of the original image. So we can see the distribution that is uh, separated. So this could be already enough to do the thresholding, but as you can see, there are lots of like oscillation that is the, coming from the contribution from the noise. <clears throat> then by, um, by applying like the smoothing, we can see that these oscillations are diminished, which means that the noise distribution is more evenly distributed, but also the distribution becomes skinnier and skinnier. But this is in our advantage when we want to separate features and then after characterize them. And here it's pretty clear that, that the more you, you use, in that case, the, 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 the higher is the sigma, the better it is to, for the distribution. So on that histogram, you don't have the full story. You just have like the intensity distribution or uh, on, on the different range. You don't see how degraded is the, the quality of the image. So this histogram will be, should be paired with like the blurriness of, of your image like uh, and other characteristics. But we can see that something like the Sigma one or Sigma two is already good enough to, to help in separating the data. Okay. Um, so here I, I'm gonna just uh, like drop that one. We're gonna see in the story just to go a little bit faster. This is just like doing a line profile. This is just to illustrate exactly the same thing that is crossing uh, like uh, the row 120 of the image. So you take the original image. I don't know if I have it available, and you make just an horizontal line and you, dis you display it as a plot. So this, this is what we call a line profile. And in that case, it was just to show that for the for the uh, especially in the background region here that you see like the effect of the noise, the amplitude of the noise is, is uh, uh, significantly diminished for the case. Oh, I use the same cases actually, three by three, sigma two, sigma four. Okay, so this is our uh, like uh, first uh, element here where we fill we apply the Gaussian filter to reduce the the, the impact of the noise on the data. And now we're gonna go into the uh, binarization step. So any questions here? Looks good, Alex. Okay. Can you tell me if like the, the pace is okay? I'm a bit too slow, too fast, I don't know. Like just let me know. Okay. Good. Great. <laughs> okay, so let's continue. Uh, hang so on, hang on. There's one question. 
Yes. Um, can you just review again? How did you make the line profile? Okay, so let's, let's do it. So um, the the idea like for the line profile. So we have a two D array, and uh, so the, the, the the idea like is that if I plot the entire so if I plot the two D array, I have the entire image. But like to for example, what I could say, I could say, okay, let me take just the data from one line. So the and the idea will be to do okay. If I, for example, if I print here, for example, image, numpy shape, sorry, numpy shape, image, this is what I get. So it will be our 2048 by 2048. Okay, so we want to change that to one along 2048. So if I do, for example, image of this, or, uh, and let me take, for example, a number 50. Here, okay. So if I run that, and I forgot the parentheses. Here, this means that I am taking all the elements from the first, the the the, the first element, and then after I only take the the element from the in this case column fifty. So here I have an, an array that is of shape two thousand forty eight, and here one. It is not written, but yeah. So now I have a one dimensional array that is just like the value, the all the values along this fifty. Uh, the same be in the other direction. If you do it like that. Okay, so if I now print that image 50 by, uh, sorry, 50 and all the elements here in the second dimension, invalid syntax. What did I do? Yeah, this parenthesis doesn't exist. Now you see I have a list of number. Uh, in one dimension. So this is like how you do like a, a basic line profile. So this is like a, not an average line profile. I just took uh, uh, a series uh, of data along one line. So it's possible to do some, uh, so uh, that's why I wanted to go a little bit faster, but it's possible to do like a little bit more sophisticated elements. So you can do, for example, I want to take uh, elements between 50 to 60, and then all the elements of the second dimension. So if you do that, you will get now a two dimensional array. But if you do the shape now of this new image, you will see that now you will have a, so let's do it like that. And by shape, sorry, what the heck is this? And by shape, image 50 to 60 times this, up. Mm, what did I do? Forgot one parenthesis. Now we have something that is 10 by uh, 2048. So what is possible to do from that image, if you want to have a line profile, you can take now the, the average, for example, of that image along what we call axis zero. Okay, and now let's print the shape of the thing. See if it's gonna work. Again, I am fighting with some here. Parenthesis. Okay, does it do anything? Yes. So now if I just print the shape of that, if the parenthesis is missing. Now I am coming back to the one-dimensional array that I can that I can plot like as a line profile. In that case, here what we have is the average between the row 50 to 60. And you 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 take uh, all the elements in the other dimension. So that that that's some ways of doing line profiles. So you see there are only a line around the horizontal and vertical axis. Uh, if then after you want to use some like for example other type of line profile, I think that SciPy as a as a as a line profile feature. Let's see. Is it finding anything? Would it be more like line profile, line profile, something like that? Okay, I don't remember like if there is anything with SciPy line profile. Uh, oh, actually, Sky Image was maybe more of them. Profile line that might be actually there is something there. Profile. Profile line. Okay, but you 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 could use for example this package. 
image source destination. But then after we will go to the detail of that function. Okay. So the, you, you can do like the, the this is the, like the manipulation of the array, uh, navigating, slicing through the array through different uh, like the, the coordinates, averaging them, summing them. That's all good. Um, okay, great. Thanks. Great. Okay, so let's go now to the next step, uh, which is also the binarization. Uh, so basically thresholding, is deciding what is the foreground, what is the background, put it to one and put it to zero. And this we're gonna, so we will uh, work on our um, uh, image one, like sigma with the uh, image that is filtered with the Gaussian filter from uh, scikit image with the sigma one. Uh, so we will start here. I'm gonna just uh, up, help myself in this, just in case, to not have anything crashing. I should have done it before. Okay, let's go. So the first thing here is that you have the data. We could have just plotted the histogram, but the idea is to have our our two distribution. And here we would like to have, like to find the threshold between these two. So any values that you will be like 130, 120, like something like that will, will dissociate from these two. So if we go like this image, uh, smooth uh, one, sigma one, and just simply as that, when you have NumPy array, this is very convenient when you have NumPy array and you just for the, the value, for example, like that, you, know, you will see that it will return you threshold, here, uh, automatic. So if you do, if you do write it like that, just below a certain value, you it will give you a set of false and true values that corresponding to that condition directly in array, simply as that. So this image threshold can be then after um, uh, changing to uh, zero once to not have a true false. But this is basically this will be int. Is it int? I don't remember if it's in character or if it's like that. We will see. It seems to have worked, and we're gonna do the plot, the fig x plot subplot im show image threshold image threshold yes, and then plot show. A invalid syntax again because I forgot the equal. And that's it. Like we have our our uh, our value. So um if you did so and it, yeah, like, so basically you have the background that is set to zero if you look at the, the, the value on the bottom right and the value on the on the particles sets to one. And of course, if you change the value of that that here, you put you know 100, let's be like something like 80 to be even more to see like a drastic change. If you change the value of the threshold, you will see like how the, the, the value, like the separation of them will change. So here you have like uh, your input in that is choosing like the threshold. And so what you want is to separate the particles, but you want to make sure also that you are not really affecting it inside the particles. And what I mean by that is you see like you might have some intensity here inside that is below the threshold and considered as the background. So you will, in that case, you will need to find like the, the proper value of the threshold that is uh, nice and uniform on the in the particle and uh, and also in the background. The one is one, the other one is zero. So we were gonna go with 120. Uh, like you can feel free to, to go to with another value. Uh, actually, I don't remember the value I used, so <laughs> we're gonna go with something like that. It's just that uh, it's visually more appealing in that case. Uh, when you have something like that. But now there is some danger that you see some of the particles might be touching. So we will see how it goes with, with that settings. But that's basically what we're gonna, uh, we're gonna go to. So we did the binarization process. And here there will be just like the, uh, other examples here by using the filters that are already available. So you have the Otsu method, ISO data, yen. Uh, it's just to show that you can use them and they will give all, for example, different values. So Otsu is giving you 114. Uh, the ISO data will give you a oh, similar 114. Actually, like this is even exactly the same. 
not very common. The yen will give you another one. Okay, and we can visualize them. Uh, so we're gonna do it again. Feed up the plots. Now, since we are four, we're gonna do a two by two. Share x equal true. Share y equal true. And uh, uh, and then now write like all the elements of the axis that we want. So there will be zero one. Dot im show. And now we're gonna do our custom threshold first. So how do we call it? Just image threshold. Very good. Let's go. Cmap equal gray. I'm gonna do all the four methods. So, oh, sorry, it will be zero, zero first. Zero, 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 one, then one, zero, and one, one, let's say something like that. Uh, this will be our odds two. It will be our ISO. This will be our EN, for example. Okay, and plot row. Once you get the habit of doing those plots often, then it's relatively quick to do them. Uh, then, okay, two mini indices for arrays, one by one, but two were indexed. What did I do? What did I do? Possibly fig dot subplots. Oh my god, hey, hey. <laughs> Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. When you're doing the same mistake again and again, oh my god. <laughs> okay, let's go. So we're gonna have a look on those particles here. With these different thresholds. So as the the uh, the Otsu and the other one is very similar, we're gonna have, uh, we are like 120, 114. We don't expect to see that many changes. The main changes will be more on the Yen one. Uh, in that case where you have like the, the different visualizations here. And uh, so typically that it will be a choice for you to make which which uh, threshold we'll be using for then after separating your data. So, you know, like that's why you have to, uh, to be transparent and then have to say, okay, I use this method to make a threshold and take the advantages and the inconveniences that you have in both cases. So ju just before fin finishing the binarization, I just wanted just to um, show one element here, uh, which is uh, the NumPy where, because it's very, very convenient. NumPy where, the function so in NumPy, uh, where you just apply your condition here. So in that case, what we're gonna apply here is that you, you just see exactly the same condition as we use for the threshold. And then after you say, I, for the condition, if, when it's met, you put one, and when it's not met, you put zero. So that will be exactly the same case of doing this thresholding. Um, the reason I want to mention that is that here you can put whatever condition that, that should results in a true or false. And here you can put whatever answer you like response you want there. It can be complex, it can be some operations and things like that. But with this type of, of, uh, of, uh, of functions, you can really go much more complex in type of you know, criteria you want to put on data. Here you just went into this one basic value. But if you have here like a formula or another equation you want to put and, or, and have maybe different cases uh, and not only separate into one to zero, you can do that. Uh, using those type of functions. So this, we're gonna just run it uh, just to show that it's doing the same thing. But, the, in the, uh, but basically, like keep in mind those, that there are lots of functions that are already existing that can do much more complex things than the threshold. Okay, so um, now I, uh, so th this section is a little bit easier. So I, I'm like, I went a little bit fast, but are there any questions? Uh, looks like you're okay to move on, Alex. Okay. Okay. So now comes the interesting things is that we have like separate this data uh, and we want like to uh, uh, analyze it. And here again, we're going to use the fabulous, the, the fabulous uh, psychic image library to look. Okay. Let me up. On the top, uh, I want to go to the, what we the measure module. 
And this, in this module, you will find like lots of like uh, properties that are uh, looking at binarized data to try to find some information on them. So the one that we're going to be using first will be label, this one. So labeled connected regions of an integer of an integer array. Uh, the idea here is that uh, uh, if you, for example, bring a, um, a binarized image, it's going to be looking at each pixel and look at the neighbors of the pixels. If it's in the, of the same value, you're going to say, okay, they are some part of the same set, and I'm going to identify them, label them as the same set. Okay, so. You put your label, you then after like uh, mention if there is any background. So in that case, we have the zero value that is a background. We're going to do that. Uh, return a num, this is just to say the number of labels that have been assigned to. So we're going to put true on that. And connectivity, uh, then after it's, it's, it's just telling you how is it looking at the neighbors because you can have like a different way of doing this connectivity. So for example, you just look at the neighbors top and left right here you look at the diagonal so it can be and to, depending on the way you choose your connectivity it will change a little bit like the the labeling identification so we're gonna go simple that's the idea of this <laughs> processing tutorial and we're gonna uh, go use uh let's use the odd two method because i think this is the one i tried so we're going to do measure dot label and we will put our image threshold O2 and uh, let me find again uh, so background connectivity I'm going to just bring them all of them up the so background zero that's the value we put our background we're going to put two see how many labels identify there and connectivity we will use the simple connectivity one and you know what, let's just bring these labels. Okay, so this is what we get. We get an array with some numbers inside. And uh, what is interesting here is this number at the end, uh, which is 228. So from that image here, he identified 200 to, to 228 different regions. And each of the regions have a, la a label. So we're going to try to uh, visualize uh, this labeled image. And you will see that it's not that uh, easy. Uh, OK, so text. OK, now I am doing the old way. Subplot one on one and like that image show. Uh, and here I'm going to internet. So we're going to do labels uh, image threshold. So here. You will see that there are two elements in here. You have one that is the array, and the other one that is 228. So I need to selection the, selection the first element because else you will see this other element in here. So let's go like that. And this is what it, it got. So okay, like, let's see. I forgot the plot show. That's fine because the matplot we can handle that. I um. Is there are just like color bar. Is there anything like something like that that will show up? Okay. So here we, I just wanted to show the color bar. So we're gonna call it image display, and we're gonna plot the color bar of in display. Doing that. Yes. So what you have here on the right is the labels from zero to two hundred twenty-eight. Is as you can see here, the colors are changing. So it's this is like not a, an easy way to see. So what are you and it think that all of them they have like one single color, and actually each of them are a different label, and following a certain number. But this with using the classic color map is not easy to visualize them because like they are you know varying linearly like linearly here, and it's not easy to understand like what are the different features. So that's why here I advise to use this uh, labels display, which is this label to RGB uh, thing that we loaded before. So we're gonna just go, uh, just execute them to see like the different visual that you have on that. And you just interpret that image now. Okay, so the labeling process ended up with that. So in this color map, you don't have like the, the values of the labels here. But what you have is that every time there is a, a, an, an area that is found, you just change the color between them. 
So you can see here, like you found isolated features a lot here. Here it seems to be finding one big feature that has exactly the same color, saying that it's from the same element, and some elements which seems to be connected here. Okay. So this is because here, if we go in here, you have the elements that are well separated from each other. The thresholding is good. The elements are separated. They can be identified as isolated. On the right here, if we move on, you will see that the threshold in the, is not allowing them to separate them. So if you apply the connectivity rule that we just used, you see them connected. So it's saying this is part of my same set, everything. So, and if you go even more on the overlapped region, this is even worse because like the, 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 the elements are even overlapped with each other. So this is what we got. Like we're using our, uh, our simple system, we have a certain set that are well separated, some others are not. Okay, but that doesn't mean that it's not usable. We can at least use all the other data that uh, in been there to just like look what is in, uh, like what is inside and exclude those ones for the moment, and then we will think about like maybe another method to deal with those on the right. Okay, so here just to help you visualize because like this is not easy. I just created two functions to just look at the subset. So we're gonna just look at the first sixty pixels, so the sixty by sixty. So this is the same as doing a little zoom on the top here. And uh, so this is what he's doing here when I take the 60 by 60 here. And I just annotated this image by ad adding the lab, the label. So the value of the label on the pixel. So if you look at here, uh, you will see. So for example, let me zoom in a little bit here. Yes. So you will see all these regions. This is one particular identified it as the label one. All these regions that you see here, this is the background identified, identified as label zero. This one here is the particle label 13, and so on and so on. That's what the label, the measure label is doing. Okay, so pretty cool. You have an automated way of doing that. Uh, and uh, and and I yeah, and yeah, and here this is just a, uh, the next plot is just to represent that idea. So this is just represent, uh, like, uh, representing uh, the, just um, like identifying just certain label. So the first image here is showing you the label zero, the next one, the label one, the label five, label 26, label 68, and so on. And you will see that you can, you can isolate and identify like the particles by themselves, by knowing their label. Okay, so is it clear? Like, I, I know this is a part that could be a little bit confusing, on what this labeling function is doing here. Any questions? Like that's the point here. I'm not seeing any, so I, I think we can move on. And if there's one, I'll I'll shut out. Yeah. Okay. But the interesting part is that that is really we separated all the elements from each other. So now we can statistically analyze them. That's the, the important part. Okay, so next we're gonna be, um, we are going to try to use uh, some of the information we got from uh, this labeling process. And for example, we can uh, use it, them as masks to mask the original data. So here we have uh, an interesting one. So the label zero represents the background, as you can see here, all the white areas. And we could say we could say like I don't want to deal with this background anymore and want it completely to remove from from uh, my original data. So it is possible to do that. Like there are many different uh, libraries to do that. One that I would suggest is to use the NumPy, NumPy module called MA, uh, MA for Max Mask Array, and the idea behind is that associated to an array, you add a mask that is going to be a Boolean, zero, one, or true, false. And, uh, and based on the condition on the mask, it is going to be just simply removing some elements of the masks. So here we have an example uh, in the documentation using, for example, this array. Uh, if you uh, use this function mask array, putting, uh, inputting this the following mask, zero, 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 one, zero, then the element that's going to be showing with one will be removed from uh, from the array, simply as that. 
Uh, I don't know if there is an example a little bit below. But then you can then after do some other type of operation, you can put some condition if you want to change a specific value, remove it or invert it, whatever. But the, the, the idea is that you have the, the, an array, the mask associated, and here we're going to be using that to remove some values from the original data. So for, from that, we're going to go here and use this uh, mask array. So I, if we check in the import statement, we call it here, import numpy.ma as ma. So we can actually just call it them. ma, where are we? The mask array. So masked array. And we were going to be using our original data, which is going to be our image smooth uh, sigma one. And here we're going to be, we, we need to put our mask value and we, we will use it directly, the one that we got from uh, the background, where the, the value one is white and the value the dark is zero. So we're going to put here a label, our label threshold. Uh, label threshold is zero. Label, label, okay. This one here, and we're gonna take the one that is equal equal to zero because this is the one we want to look from the background. So let's execute that. Okay, and we're gonna print what we have. So we have an array that is 248 by 248, which corresponds to the original data. As you can see, there are some areas which are empty here. Those are values that are removed from the array, so they are still present. Uh, to have, you still have the original size, but you have no value associated with the location of this array. So if you plot this mask, this is what you get. You get simply the original data with the background removed. This can be very interesting because in the previous uh, data that uh, we have it, when, for example, you do the histogram, you have the contribution from the background and the contribution from your, in this case, those particles. By removing the, 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 the contribution of the background on the histogram, you might now look at the particle specifically and maybe find a way of dissociating the one that are overlapping with each other, the one that are separated, because as you can see, the gray level is different. So this is a very, very convenient way of, uh, of for example, removing one aspect of the data that you don't want to deal with uh, like for, in this case, the background. And of course, you can do that for any area that has been labeled during segmentation. So we can, for example, repro reproduce the same pro pro procedure with uh, the label, uh, so for example, 68. So if we come back here, the label 68 is at the row one one. So this one that is just localizing this specific particle. So let's go in here, call it, same masked array, masked array. Now we're going to do the same image smooth one. And we will now call the label threshold of zero. And now we're going to do equal equal 68. Right, so let's go. Let's visualize that. Now, as you can see, here, the, the, the data has been with the 68 removed. So we have access to all of the ones except the one that is removed. This is because the mask is acting as uh, the, the default parameters like that. The mask is acting on where is one to remove it. So if we come back here, as the, the here, the label, the, the value true is for the particle, for the label, for the particle label 68. Uh, now it's actually removing it. So to simply uh, keep the particle label 68 and remove all of them, you simply just do the invert of that of that array and uh, where the oops sorry I did it where did I did it it was here I wanted to do it so I probably did it in the wrong element but that's okay probably did that on the background did it on Ah, yes, I did it on the background. So for example, we can see that in that case, we did exactly the opposite where we keep the background and remove the, all the other one. So for the same process here, if we redo it here. We're gonna here, for example, isolate one, one particle from all the others. And of course you could do that, for example, if you want to identify the others, uh, select just a few elements for, from your orig uh, original image. Uh, so then everybody, everything can be customized to the level that you want. 
So, okay, after like uh, talking about the segmentation process, um, we're gonna go look at the properties of the, all the segmented element, which is one important aspect that we, we went through all of this, is to characterize all these particles automatically, have some properties. <clears throat> um, so the idea behind the, the, the looking to the properties uh, is, is uh, for example, look at the, the centroid, look at the area, the, the ellipticity. So this type of parameters that can be automatically uh, found uh, by, uh, by the sky image library. Um, so we're going to be looking at uh, a, a module called um, uh, called so the good uh, region props. The function is region props, but the module is from measure again. So here, here what it is. So what region props is looking for is looking for a label image. So we'd make that work just before a segmented image. So it means that each area separated with some labels associated with them. And then here we have some other parameters that we can look at, like uh, the, especially in the defining some additional properties if you want to. Uh, so here on the bottom, you will see like all the, the properties that are already associated with uh, uh, the, the region props function. So for example, centroid, area, uh, the label, for example, moments, some other element parameter, for example, that you can automatically get by just executing them. If uh, you know how to uh, code the, those properties, so following like the requirements for that function, you can even add your extra properties that you want from them. But of course, you will need to go to, into the documentation to write the function accordingly. So we're gonna go very simple. And we're gonna just input our label image here to see like with the, the list of properties that we get from that. So for that function, we're gonna use the, the um, uh, module measure. So as you can see here, we import it sky image dot measure measure as measure. So we're gonna call it this one directly. And from measure, we're gonna, yeah. let's go. Where are we? In here, we're gonna do region props. Okay, off. Our labeled image, threshold, and we will just execute that. Okay. Okay, so we can print the properties, see how it looks like. Clicking on the properties, you will see that you have lots of elements here that it seems to be not readable. So if you look to the type of properties, you will realize that here you have something that is a list. So you have a list of elements. And actually what is happening here is that is, is building the properties for each different label. So uh, you will have the length of the properties that corresponds to the length of the number of labels that you have. So if we go and look, for example, at the property zero here, okay, let's go to yeah, 68 because we, I just put it here and to look at the one that is area label 68. It's important that when you measure the properties, the, the, the background value is uh, removed. Uh, so when you, for example, target this label 68, you have to go to the 767th element of the list. So if you have that, we have this class of region props. So we need now to access the elements of the class. So technically you should go to the documentation to, to do how to look at that, but we will just intuitively type here, for example, dot area. And you will get a number here. So it's not calibrated. We have here the area and number of pixel. And you can here uh, just go to some other parameters or so centroid. Uh, I don't remember which one, for example, the perimeter. Perimeter. What else do we have? Oh, the well, label, let's go. Put the number label, so we will check that we are on the proper label. And that's it. That's what we do. you get. So you get the, the uh, element label 68 that has an area of 6,291 pixels square. I, I would imagine that it's how we're going to be uh, uh, writing this. The centroid, the coordinate of your centroids here. 
and uh, the 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 perimeter. So again, everything is in pixels or index because we are we have not calibrated anything in that case. Uh, so and and here you can have this. Uh, we are, you can use these properties for all the uh, elements that you have uh, identified during your segmentation process. So technically, your work would be done here. You can have your statistical uh, the. Uh, uh, meaningful elements from your uh, processing. So you went here from the Gaussian filtering uh, to reduce the contribution of noise and after thresholding, segmenting and get some uh, properties. Uh, here, what we're gonna do is play a little bit with the, with the elements to like just add a little, uh, some, some uh, features. Like, so for example, we're gonna try to map the contour of the element label 68. Uh, but like from from there, technically the your uh, processing is uh, is uh, is over. You can go now doing the statistical analysis of your of your results. So let's go dive a little bit in those details and then first see, for example, how we can get those uh, controls with the same uh, module. You can find there so probably the kind controls be the function here. You can uh, by this is actually not just re related to only here the the any label image you can put whatever image but if you put an image and after you select a certain level then you will try to find the control map that will uh, fit to the level so here we have like the the you can measure the the control from the label image because if we target one specific label we have a true and false uh, um, or zero one binarized image so we can use that for example, find contours. And here in our image, we're gonna put our labels, threshold zero here, equal equal 68. So in here, we are targeting the particle here. We're gonna put a level of let's say 0 0.9 and, uh, and let's see what we get from here. I should print it actually. Up. But this is what we get, we get an array that is a list of coordinates. All these coordinates are following the, uh, the contour of the, the, uh, the element. As you can see, there is a, this is a list, so with one element inside. So if you go to, for example, type, you will see that it's a list of arrays. So this is important because you can have multiple contours. And as here we have only one contour, what we're gonna be interested in is to have like the contour from the element zero here. And here we will have the, so, that's you want the type of everything. Here it should be an, an empire array. So we're gonna be using this list of coordinates to plot the contour around the particle 68. So uh, for that, you can you, we will do it. Uh, we will do it here. So this is what we want to do: is to plot his the contour. Uh, for example, here we can just put that the uh, whatever image on the back, either the entire image, or just let's put the, um, uh, the label threshold 68. So can I put here labels threshold zero equal equal 68, for example, equal gray. That's going to be our background image. You will see only this particle. Uh, on the plot here, we, we will put our uh, our um, contours elements. So, can I do contour? Contour sixty-eight. And here, what is important to remember is that the NumPy array and the visualization that you have are inverted. So we're gonna look all the elements from the first column first, and all the elements from the other element second. In here and let's put a color for the element. So here, uh, I was initially thinking about putting here the scatter plot. We can we can actually do it. Uh, so this will be the coordinate, for example, of the centroid. So use those coordinates that we have for the centroid. So we can use, for example, uh, properties uh, of sixty-seven since we look at the label 68.centroid.1, for example, for the scatter plot is uh, you give a list of X and Ys, and as you did, this will be giving you like the intensity that you want to put on this, this top. 
let's put something like that. And we can now give a size. But then we'll be in the size, so we will see like put one, I have a small dot. If I put ten, I will have a bigger dot. This kind of plot. And the annotation, oh, it was like to put the, um, the label. So what you put in annotation is uh, the text that you want to put and the coordinates of the text that you want to use. So we will use uh, these properties our, as our text. The same idea, we will use the coordinates of the centroid to position the, to position our text. Okay, so let's, let's see what we get. Okay, oh, an error here because I forgot this thing here. And of course, every parameter needs to have an equal in the element, and this is what we got. Uh, okay, so the um, contour plot didn't show up, and because the idea here, I should have an error message. Yeah, exactly. List of indices must be integers of slices, not tuples. This is the problem here because I called contour 68 directly, and this is a list, and he's expecting uh, the arrays of elements, so he's not happy about that. So I need to add here something to tell him that you want to look at the first element of the list, it is the only element of the list. And here we are, okay, let's change the color, just to not have the same color as the as the other one here. And we can maybe put a color here also. In that case, boom, that will, here we are. We can zoom in a little bit, if it lets me, yes. And this is, for example, your control plot around these elements. So. If you want here, you could have put uh, in your image show, for example, image smooth directly. And this will be your contour around your original image. So the, the, the good point of, of the here is that you are providing here like a certain methodology to map this contour. You could do it manually. You could do uh, uh, using any, uh, um, any other type of stuff, uh, software and even do it by hand. Uh, but here you have a, like a kind of criteria that you decided and you can uh, afterwards even show how this contour has been mapped. So you have this this, this function here. Uh, actually, I'm just curious if we just change, for example, to a slightly higher level, does it change anything regarding the contour or not? Because we did that on the labeled image. Ah, maybe on some specific cases. But of course, this all will depend on the, the like how the thresholding has been done, the segmentation process has been done. But here, like, uh, I would say, a repetitive, um, reliable, not maybe reliable, but linear, you can do it in a repetitive manner. So if you apply this, you can apply this, uh, of course, for any other type of particles that we have here. Um, so this, in the following, uh, this is just like a, showing you, like, a, you can, uh, do this like for all the, the labeled elements here. So we're going to just com compute all the contours for all the labels that have been, all the labeled uh, elements that we identify during this segmentation process. And uh, so in, in the, the difference in comparison in here is that we're going to be looping on all the elements of the threshold. So we will start from one to the maximum uh, label. Uh, the maximal index of the label. And each time we're gonna find a contour and we will append that to a list, a list of contours. And uh, and here then after we can select some specifically if we want to uh, just highlight something. Uh, here I would propose to go to those, to those following uh, uh, labels. And the same idea is that now we can also loop when we're uh, doing the, the, the plotting uh, and, and plot all the elements Individually, so for example, the contour, the centroid, and, and so on. So this is just a reproduction of exactly the same process that we did here, but we just like multiple elements and you, and you added in a loop. So if we go towards that, you will see. So one, five, six, 68, 67. So probably those elements of the list are the same one that have been chosen here. So one, five, 26, and so on. So or you can yeah select, select some of them and do uh, this type of display. Uh, other labels of the interest that I wanted to show are uh, these ones. So for example, especially the one labeled uh, 19. So as we discussed before, um, because um, during the thresholding process, uh, some of the elements have, couldn't be separated. 
So because first they are not separated, they are touching each other. So either a different thresholding level would have been chosen to separate them or you have to accept that. Plus the area where you have this overlap, this big area is identified as a single area. So for example, we can even go here. You can see the contour is really like following even in the areas where they are joined. So you have this type of surface that is uh, uh, a bit weird, but that is what has been identified. Uh, other things that are worth mentioning is for example, this label. So we still have like some areas uh, that has been picked up during the thresholding, uh, which are very, very small and little. So here we have like really just a couple of pixels around that. And those things can happen again. So either the denoising has not been strong enough or the thresholding level has not been appropriate, but you will find like the couple of those uh, still present in the 200 labels that have been identified. So usually the labels try to follow from each other from top to bottom and uh, from left to right. But because of those uh, those elements that are appearing, the, 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 the labeling of the elements might not be sometimes straightforward to find. Um, so, um, so in the following, uh, what is just presented uh, to conclude is um, to try to is um, when you, for example, see in this set of results, you are, you might say, I'm not happy that I am including in the statistics those uh, label for those elements like label 19 and label 17, and I would like to remove them. Uh, so the good part is that again, since you are dealing with the, your Python script, you can custom. Uh, the, the elements that you want to analyze and discriminate them for, from each other, putting a criteria that you, you want to use. And in the, the idea here will be say, why not here use the area as a way to discriminate all the, uh, the elements that have, been, that have been labeled. So if we look at he, the, those identified here, the, 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 the area is expected to be a, uh, uh, around a certain range. Uh, we can say like more than 10 pixels, but also smaller than let's say, uh, uh, 100,000 pixels, because like the shape of the, the of the elements that you have here are following a certain statistics. So, uh, like just to visualize that, we can uh, look at all the parameters of uh, uh, look at the uh, certain parameters of all the labels that have been identified. So we use the uh, same module measure, but instead of calling region props, we call it as a table. This way, we have it will print right away uh, the elements that we have you're chosen so label area centroid and perimeter those are not really needed but i just wanted to show that you can show all the other elements and now we're going to just print the property properties table so as you can see here we're going to be focusing on this area um but this is the we, we can see that the non-negligible ones are finding area between one three one all of these so all the same this is the same problem as we identify in this label 17 here. Those areas is probably those, those artifact of some small elements that are still picked up during the thresholding uh, um, phase that shouldn't be included in our statistic that we can remove. On the same uh, side, we have here the label 19 that will should be paired with the, the one that will have, have an enormous number in terms of area that could be also rejected. So we, in the, Following, we will just uh, filter this data based here on the criteria of the area. So we will not go to the detail. I will let you go uh, to, to, towards the code like, to look at that. But just basically, what you want is just to loop through all the elements, so all the labels that you have. You put an if statement regarding the area that you have here. So we want the area to be between, for example, 50 and, uh, uh, and uh, I think they put the limit 10,000. And we will uh, just collect the indices. So collect the labels that are meeting that criteria. Okay. And then the, the line that you have here is that we're going to be looping through all these labels and remove all the, uh, the labels that are not fitting the criteria that is before. So. So sorry, I'm gonna just repeat. Here we're gonna make the in, like the negation of this of this if statement. We're gonna collect the indices that we want to remove. In the following one, we're gonna just remove the elements uh, based on the indices that we uh, identified, the label that we identified uh, being not for the following the criteria regarding the area. So you can run that. You see this pretty fast. And you print the table again with filtered. So now what we have is the same idea: label, area, and so on. 
But now you can see that some of the labels have been removed accordingly to the one that are with, the, with not respecting of the criteria of the area. So we filtered out data. So maybe here the 87 may be here questionable, it will be still kind of a small particle, so we can maybe tune it a little bit more. But here we remove all the singular ones, uh, plus we uh, uh, remove all the big ones. Um, we could here maybe check the length, and if it's possible to check it quickly, uh, the length of this. Like for example, if we just, so we had 228 label. If we just print, oh, let me just add here, print that a cell above, print the length of the indices to remove. 121. So actually half of the data were constantly like, we're not respecting our criteria. It have been rejected from the statistics. So quite non negligible I think that here, this is kind of telling that maybe um, that the, the something could have been improved regarding the threshold, especially the the, uh, the one that are capturing those little ones. Uh, I would even say that maybe the noise could have been like the blurring phase could have been a little bit stronger to to uh, remove those uh, little artifacts. But anyway, you can correct it afterwards during the post processing aspect and have it here. And um, what we are finishing here, yes. So this is just a visual of the label, the final label that we have kept after removing all the artifact, the artifact one. So we see that we removed the big 19. And that's the one we are left here. So with the, the, the processing condition that we have selected, we are only capturing the one on the left. But nonetheless, it still has some, have some statistical value. You could, for example, at the end print, so here, an histogram of the area and have your area distribution uh, of the particles that has been selected here. So we will get started with Fiji. It looks like um, no extra questions came in, Alex. So great job. Okay. Um, and as we mentioned, we'll be posting the rest of it on the YouTube channel. Uh, so we'll begin with the Fiji portion now, um, realizing that we're a little short on time. So yeah, I'm if, sorry. No, that's that's totally <laughs> fine, Alex. So we it it's, it takes a while, and real things happen. Um, so if you need to drop off at the scheduled 1.30, feel free. Um, we will continue to stay on and keep going through the tutorial session and we'll keep the recording going. Um, so it will be available afterwards if, if you can't stay to the full finish. All right, Joao, if you want to begin, it's all hey, yours. Boy. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so we're going to now switch to Fiji. Uh, we're going to do the same operations as Alex did. Um, and hopefully you see the, the differences in it's just a matter of user interface, but uh, we'll try to go, I'll try to go slow, but still uh, make the points that Alex uh, made and reinforce them in a different way. Okay, so let me start sharing the screen. Again, sound-wise, everything is fine, right? I suppose. That's good, here. we can see it. Perfect, okay, good. So uh, this is Fiji, so you download Fiji from the website, we did it already last time. And we are gonna start by uh, looking at the image that we have been studying uh, during this workshop. So this is the image 013 Seta. Oops, so if I just drag and drop, you see that this opens the image. Now, the first thing that I noticed as an uh, image analyst is that this doesn't have a scale bar. So the, there's no metadata referring to the size of the real size of the image. I do have a scale bar, but it doesn't really uh, tell me much. It, doesn't, it just tells me that this line is around 500 meters. But this, the computer doesn't know that this is 2048 uh, pixels uh, times whatever uh, real size each pixel is. I also noticed this is an RGB file. So, and I can clearly see visually that this is a monochromatic image. Uh, there's only different levels of gray. Uh, so there are some things that we need to, to change on the image. Uh, sorry, um, before we can proceed. Um, so let's start doing that. So the quick thing that I always like to do when I'm working with Fiji is that I like to duplicate my original file. So I can go here, I can duplicate this image. So now I hope you can see that I have two similar images and this will be useful because I'll do two different treatments on both images, okay? I'll duplicate it again, just to have a backup in case something goes awfully wrong and I'll just minimize it. So just in case something happens. 
And now one thing that uh, Alex mentioned in the beginning is, uh, I can do this, synchronized windows. What this will allow me to do is actually, uh, and I'll try to put the cursor there so you guys can see. So I have CETA1 and I have CETA-1. Uh, and now you see that my mouse, as I hover, and I hope you can see my mouse, as I hover through uh, each image, you see that the opposite pixel is being highlighted in the, the, the other image. So I hope you can see this. And let's just go here and mark one pixel. So I'm going to select, and you see that I marked this pixel specifically. And if I now use my magnifying glass, and I start zooming into that pixel, you'll see that uh, if you look into the, into the bar where we get the information about the pixel size and everything, if I hover over this pixel, which is the, on the RGB file, I get uh, 0, 21, 0, 21, 0, 21. This means that my red value is 0, 21, my green value is 0, 21, and my blue value is 0, 21. And OK, this doesn't seem to be correct because I mean, I have a monochromatic image. So what I can do is I can go here. Uh, let me just push this aside. Image type, make this image 8-bit. And now you see that as I hover the mouse over this pixel, which has been marked before, now I only have a 21 pixel. So I lose information from the red, blue, and green channels. Uh, sorry, red, green, and blue channels, RGB, right? Uh, and I convert this into an 8-bit image, which is what we have. OK, so let's do the same thing for both images. And this, was gonna, this is going to solve the, we're gonna solve the issue that we have with the RGB files. OK, so now I solved the issue of the RGB, of the pixel format. Now let's solve the, the issue that we have with the uh, scale bar. And again, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Same uh, rules apply as uh, we'd have with Alex. Um, so first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to select now the line tool, as you can see here. I'm going to make an approximation. Go there. And again, this is all because the original file doesn't have the metadata uh, which the microscope probably provided. So I'm now going to try to adjust my edges. So we want to be precise as much as possible in science. And this is very important. Um, so try to not make the angle uh, any tilt. So make an angle of zero. So this is where my pixel start, my scale bar starts. And now if I go all the way to the end, and again, this is what synchronized windows allows you to do. You can do the same operations in both images at the same time. So you see, this is a bit too much. So I can now just cut this down to, uh, well, 633 pixels. This is basically what this uh, scale bar is. OK, so now I know that if I zoom out, these 633 pixels are 500 meters. So what I can do, I can go into my uh, bar. I can look for set scale. And now I can tell it, OK, this pixel distance, which is 633, is actually 500. Again, this is like, like we did for the, to, for the, for the previous tutorial uh, solution. And now we're using nanometers instead of micrometers. So again, the 633 comes from the line measurement that we did. Uh, which is he knows, so the software knows. And we know that this is 500 meters by looking at the scale bar. So now I press OK. And I see that this image now has metadata, has like uh, information about the real size of this, of this file. I'll do the same thing on this one. Again, set scale. This is especially good if you don't know where the commands are within the different menus. You can just look for them directly um, with uh, the Fiji search bar. And again, 633, and this is 500, and nanometers. OK, so now I have two images uh, in exactly the same, same conditions. So they are both now 8-bit. They have metadata. And now I can proceed to try to identify um, or try to segment these objects. So we know that we have, uh, visually, we can see that we have particles in this image. And we just want to get an idea, first of all, how many, how big they are, uh, what's the intensity inside each object. So these are all things that we can do with Fiji, much like we did also with the Jupyter notebook approach. So now this is where things can get interesting. So on this image, I'm not going to filter it whatsoever. I'm not going to apply any Gaussian blur, any bit in filter. I'm not going to do anything like that. So this will be 
basically as raw as it can be. And for that, I'm going to go here and I'm going to rename this into unfiltered. So this image will change its name. And this will be my image, but this time I'll make it, I'll apply some modifications. And this will be useful because this will show the importance of uh, treating your image before actually processing it. So this will be now my filtered image. Okay. I'll just go back and make it a bit bigger so you guys can appreciate uh, the image a bit better. Okay, so uh, here's what I'm gonna do. First things first, let's go through filters. What can we do to this image to make it uh, less noisy? So as remember from Yarden's presentation at the beginning, we can apply convolution uh, kernels to, we can apply filter kernels and convolve this image to get the desired effect. So how do you do that? You can go to process, filters. And you see that these are already the, the most commonly used ones already available, but we can also do something quite, quite special, which is like if I click on the convolve button, this tells me, okay, which kernel do you want to apply to the image? And in this case, let's just use this default one. And if I press the preview button, so I'm gonna push this aside. If I press the preview, you see that this creates something completely weird, even worse than what we expect. Uh, if we want to do the, Identity kernel, which is again a bit basic, but uh, oops, sorry. Ah. Okay, if I preview this, you see nothing really changes. And now, if I want to do the uh, approximation to the Gaussian as um, Alex did, oops, cannot forget to do that one to one. You can see it's a very poorly noticeable, but you can see that as I click the preview on and off, you see that you're starting to blur slightly the image. Again, a very mild, very mild blur, okay? So again, you can play with different values. You can go, I don't know, like, let's just go, uh, let's go a bit random. 5.6, then I can do a zero minus two, one, and let's make three, six, one. I don't know, I don't know how this is gonna look like, but again, you see that this is each, you can apply your own specific kernel and you can preview what this does. Okay, so again, this is just a generic way to apply any kernel that you see fit that you want to play with your images. Again, all we're doing is doing some mathematical operations to the numbers inside uh, that image. Okay. And if I'm going too fast, let me know. Okay, so let's go back to the offer to the image and now let's apply more traditional filters. So let's try to look to see how uh, a normal median filter would look like. So if I play a median, and again, the cool thing about feature, you can actually preview uh, the effect. So if you click preview, you see that this, and I'll try to actually, let me just zoom in a bit more so you guys can see a bit better what I mean. So let's focus on this particular subset. And if I go to filters and I apply a median, you see that if I apply a radius of the kernel of two, two pixels, you get this effect. If I go five, you see that you get a different effect. Nine, you get even more. So you see that you're smoothing completely your image. All the background uh, speckles are not completely uniform. Imagine that you're painting, you're having, you're in front of a, of a, paint, of a painting, and you're just uh, with some watercolor and just pushing your hand and you bring the certain strength against the painting and brushing against it. So that's what you're doing. You're, you're smudging the whole, the whole picture. Okay, so this is what the median filter looks like. Again, we can do uh, mean, variance, we can do all kinds of different filters which are available. And again, Fiji or ImageJ has a very nice uh, help um, uh, web page where you can see what each thing actually does to your uh, image. So let's go with the classical Gaussian blur. And here, uh, again, I'm gonna try to uh, preview. So. Let's try to do a very mild one. So you see that as I change the sigma, so whereas the way we did the Gaussian with the Jupyter notebook was a discrete uh, approximation. So uh, we try to fit the kernel into that. But the way we do it in Fiji is actually we use a continuous function to do that. So it's, a, it's much more mathematically, um, uh, how do I say that? Much more mathematical uh, 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 pertinent. It's, it's actually the real, the real thing. So in the sigma is basically the variance that I'm gonna apply that I'm gonna leave within the, my bell-shaped curve. 
So you see that if I apply a phi sigma, I'm getting all the different values. I'm, I'm just imagining much more than if I go for a very mild Gaussian blur. And although you might not fully grasp why this can be important, sometimes when you, for example, if you do a, a microscope image and you have a very uh, inhomogeneous field, uh, light, uh, field of light, illumination field, by smudging your image dramatically and then normalizing it, you can actually make it more homogeneous. Uh, again, this is something that we can discuss uh, at a later date. I think it's a bit not, we're not ready for that just yet in this tutorial. Hopefully in the future ones. Okay, so let's just do a very simple uh, Gaussian filter of two. So you see that this, this image got changed. And now we already start seeing the visibility of two images in terms of the, um, of the boringness. So um, next thing that we have to do is, and this is something that uh, it's, it's a bit annoying, but Fiji, um, I mean, there are some uh, inconsistencies that we need to fix. So the next thing we're going to do is actually we're going to start thresholding both images. But to do that, we need to uh, make sure that Fiji understands that our background is going to be black and our foreground is going to be white. So there's something you have to do. You go to uh, process, binary, and if you go to options, you can see here that you have to check, make sure that you have checked this, this option. Make sure that your background is going to be black, OK? This will be important when we're going to do then the uh, binarization and segmentation of the image. So I'm going to say, OK. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast, or is everyone still following? We're so good, Joao. OK, good. I'm going to try to fit within the time, OK? Uh, so we have, again, uh, again, a recap. We have a fil unfiltered and a filtered image. So now let's uh, try to apply a threshold. So I'm going to go now to adjust threshold. And again, I'm going to put the window here. And you'll see that uh, this uh, menu shows up. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it, the, the current thing is that he thinks that the background is actually uh, dark, but it's not. It's actually um, white. So if I do it again here. You see that he's now selecting my particles. Okay, just make sure that you're dark. You don't have a dark background because you can clearly see that this is actually not dark. Now, one thing that uh, we mentioned is that there are different ways to threshold an image, different filters of fresh thresholding. And Fiji has this, these filters uh, already available in its uh, written code. So if you go to this uh, default window, to this default option, and you click on it, <clears throat> and let me again just try to focus on this image so we can see the difference. What if each different uh, you see already that there are differences within the because of the pre treatment of the images. But if I just apply here, the um, let's focus on this one here on the one on the right. You see that as you scroll down and you change the different thresholding method you're applying, your regions get slightly different. Again, especially in these two, you can see you're starting differences among themselves. Okay. So we can, this one binds them a bit more. This one still gets some very, very uh, touching together. This one, for example, the percentile actually allows us to actually separate individualized uh, particles in this area, for example. And again, you can just figure out what, uh, what would be the best approach for your different particles. So <clears throat> based on what I saw, I believe that we should go for the percentile uh, the threshold in this case. So, and now if I apply the same filter on the unfiltered image, you'll see that the results will be slightly different. You see? Whereas here I have an homogeneous uh, uh, structure, an homogeneous object. On the image on the left, because I did not filter it in the past, I have this speckle still present. And this can be an issue, as you'll see afterwards. Okay? Any questions so far? So far, so good? Um, so what we have to do now is just apply the different methods. So I'm going to apply this percentile method on this image. And I'm going to also select the image on the right, and I'm going to apply it. And now what I have created, I have two black and white images. So all the pixels now, they are either 0 or 1. That's it. There's nothing else. So we reduced by these uh, processes our objects to basically yes or no uh, to a binarized image, yes or no. Is it positive or is it negative? Now, one thing that Alex showed you, and again, before we continue, I, I think I should mention that, 
he mentioned you the, pro the profiles, intensity profiles of your image. We can also do that with Fiji. So again, if I wanted to do that, I can go, go select a line. I can draw a line throughout this area. <clears throat> and if I go to analyze and I say plot profile, and I go live, you see that, again, you either have zero values or 255. There's nothing in between. Let me try to zoom in into a specific area so we can actually appreciate that. So let's see that I have my line here through this, through this plot. And you see that it's zero in, in the beginning, right? Completely zero. Then it goes up to 255 as it goes to the first pixel that's now white. It's stabilized because it's fully white. And then it goes back to, to zero, okay? If you do the same thing on the original image, so let's just try to open the original image, which I saved it for last. If I now select shift control E, so you see that this is where my line is. If I now zoom in there and I go now into this uh, plot profile, again, I just have to analyze it again into a plot profile. You see that now because I don't have a binarized image, I have different values, okay? Uh, and again, we see that it's not as smooth as we saw before, okay? Any questions so far? Again, what we did was we transformed this uh, uh, original file into zeros and ones. And because our object is homogeneous and we say that our object is actually white, that's why on the on our uh, on the, uh, on the plot profile, we see that this area is now completely white and here it's actually in the lower values because here it's white. Am I making myself clear? I hope so. So, Joao, there's no questions currently. I'll let you know if anything pop up. How's the speed? Speed okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so one cool thing that we can also do, and this is something that uh, uh, I think Alex, Alex also mentioned, is that we can make our lines wider than they can be. So if I make my line, uh, oops, let me just go here. If I click on my line being wider, and again, on this image, you're not going to see major differences, but you see that as I enlarge my image, I'm not my line, I'm now capturing this area here. So that's why I start getting these weird uh, averages. So you're actually averaging the, the whole value in each, in each pixel along this line, okay? Uh, again, this can be quite useful if you want to get an idea about uh, homogeneity throughout your tissue. Okay, so there are many things you can do. So Again, this, you can feel free to figure out uh, different applications for this. So I'm going to close the plot profile and I go back to the, to the ongoing uh, purpose, which is to try to find information about this image. Okay, so I thresholded my images, so I can now close this window. And now one very cool thing that Fiji has uh, is, let's try to uh, ask the computer what he can see. And for doing that, we actually need to go to analyze particles. Okay. So <clears throat> this opens this menu, which has several options. And I'll try to go through the major ones. Uh, again, there's much more information that can be found on the website on the help menus. And again, if you, if you are stuck, you can feel free to contact me by email or towards the questions and uh, the question section of this, of this tutorial. So the thing that you can notice is that you can actually uh, filter by size. Um, so in this case, I'm not gonna do any filtering, but you can actually say, I want only one part which are above 200 square nanometers, okay? <clears throat> so then the computer is gonna go through all through this image and it's gonna see everything that's uh, below 200 is gonna be discarded and only things between 200 and above are gonna be uh, acquired. I'll just keep it no filtering there. You can also filter by circularity, meaning if you have a circular object, in this case, uh, these particles they think could be quite circular, you could apply a filter towards that, saying I only want particles which are above 0, 80% 80, 80 circular. So if you, have, if you have weird shapes, like for example, these uh, weird intersections, they will probably be disregarded <clears throat> when you do the, 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 the analyzed particles. And again, I'm gonna do them several times so you can actually see what this, what this creates. So I'm going to display the results. I'm going to create the results, and I'm going to go to manager, and I'm not going to include holes. 
Again, every option has its meaning. I'll try to just go one by one. So if I go now to my uh, filtered image, oops, let me just select the right tool. Okay, I'm now gonna analyze particles. I'm gonna go for the default settings. I'm not gonna include holes. And you'll see that he immediately, <clears throat> again, uh, my screen might be a bit too small, but I hope you guys can appreciate what we just created. So we created a results table where every single uh, ROI that was detected, now we have area measurements, the mean value, in this case, because we only have white values, it'll be 255. The centroid position, the perimeter, the circularity of each particle, uh, the raw integrated density, again, all these numbers can be automatically calculated by Fiji. Again, in this case, it doesn't make much sense because we're looking at the binarized image, but what it also can do is, and this is what I want to highlight your uh, or point your attention to, is that now we have this ROI manager window uh, present. And as you can see, this has the different ROIs that, uh, that the software detected. And if I go one by one, you see that number one is actually this, that area there. If I start scrolling down, you see that I'm going to start creating these uh, different objects. Okay. So if you want to see them all, this is what he captured. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all my ROIs and I'm going to save them. And I'm going to save them in my desktop. Doesn't really matter. I'll just say that this is from the filtered data set. And now let's say that I'm going to close the stuff. I just say that I want to close all my measurements. I don't care about that. And now I can go back to my original file, which we have over here. Right. So this is the original file that we have in RGB. I just make it 8 bit so it's a bit easier to understand. And now what I can do is I can just drag and drop my, uh, my filtered. So this is where my file is. I can just drag it and now you can see that if I hover this to the main image these are the ROIs that I found before okay so that's pretty cool now because the the binarization allowed me to identify the objects and now I can actually use these ROIs and just get, actually get the real the real values from the real image so if I just do a quick measurement here I have all the different values and now we see that the values are slightly different because this is coming from the original image. Okay, so again, we use the binarization and thresholding and the filtering to create and to, uh, to segment our image. So now we have ROIs, which are easily identifiable by the computer, and then we can apply them to the original file to get the real information that we want to acquire from our real image. Okay, uh, and this is quite quite powerful, as you can imagine. Okay, uh, one thing that's also very useful, and I forgot to mention, is if you want to add more measurements, you can go to Analyze, Set Measurements, and here you can select whatever things you want to plot. <clears throat> you can plot the diameter, the, the modal gray value, the standard deviation, the min max. And basically now if I go back to my file and I say, okay, excuse me, I now have a, a lot more stuff uh, that I wanted to, to be calculated. And this is extremely fast and quick. And also uh, the, the user interface is, I think, to me, very, very appealing. Okay, so now let's see what happens when I do the same thing, the same analyzed particles, but now this time on the unfiltered image. So I'm just gonna delete all these things. Again, <clears throat> I'll just, maybe I can, I can talk about it again. So if I now go analyze particles on the unfiltered image, and I apply the same conditions as before, You first notice that uh, because I didn't apply any filters, let me remove the labels. I still find the particles, but if I look carefully, I'm actually detecting these small pixels, the one by one pixels, because I didn't filter my image before. Okay. So, although if you look from a distance, it looks like, oh, you did a good job. Actually, I found in this case 20,882 objects which as we can know, because uh, we're not a computer, we actually can interpret the data. This makes no sense, right? So filtering before, the, before you actually do these thresholds and these uh, conversions can be extremely important. 
because a computer uh, doesn't really uh, understand shapes because we as humans, we have a brain, we can actually understand and can make sense of information. We can make sense of this, but a computer thinks of zeros and ones. For him, if it's a one, it's an object. So he's gonna mark it. He doesn't care about sizes. So how can we reduce this if we don't wanna do any filtering? <clears throat> Again, like, first of all, let me just save this, this, uh, these ROIs. Uh, let's just call this unfiltered. Okay. And again, I'll just push this into the uh, administrator file. Sorry, I have three screens and it's sometimes a bit of a mess to find the, the, where the files go. So these are my ROIs. <clears throat> okay, so let's see what happens now if I do the analyze particles. But this time, Oh, and again, you can always save these measurements into a CSV file. So all these tables can be saved. And this can all be done also by macro. If you want to do everything by macro, you can also do this if you, again, follow the tutorial number one. So let's go back to the unfiltered image, and now let's do a bit of thresholding in our detection. So let's say I want to get uh, the particles which are at least, I don't know, uh, 150 square nanometers and which are also uh, 0.8 and above in terms of circularity. <clears throat> and again, I'm gonna run the macro as is. Oh, sorry, did I make something wrong here? Uh, analyze particles, uh, pixel image. Da, 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 da. Ah, okay, sorry, I think I know what, it might be the size, uh, it might be a bit too, too generous with the size or the security. <laughs> so let's put security at 0 0.5. Ah, so now he found two objects, okay? Okay, so I'm not going crazy here. So what was the issue is probably the security issue. Um, so which object do we find? Let's just try to find them. Oh, it's funny. He actually finds these zeros from the 500 uh, scale bar. That's kind of cool, actually. Kind of interesting. <laughs> so let's just try to uh, not do circularity anymore. Let's remove that. And again, it'll be very nice if we could actually have a preview of the what's going to be detected. But again, this is not implemented. Don't save these measurements. Oh, wait, sorry. I, I apologize. I actually have to deselect select the whole image. So if you have to go here, just control A. So now I can analyze the whole image. And if I do the same thing, OK, I'm not going crazy. So now you can actually find. Uh, a more adequate number, not the crazy 20,000 particles that you saw before, okay? So this is what can be done just by filtering by size your particles. It can be very useful. But as you see, we still have some gaps in between, which can be annoying. So that's why if you go into analyze particles and you select include holes, what this does is actually, if he finds that there are uh, black spots inside the, the ROI that he detects, he's gonna ignore them and basically cover the hole. So make, he's gonna make it a more homogeneous structure. <clears throat> and again, uh, exclude edges says that I'm gonna exclude particles which are the edges of my image. So since I cannot see the full uh, size of my particle, if it touches the edge, I'm gonna disregard it completely. Uh, that way you can ensure that you're only measuring full objects, not in this case, if you go for example for yeah, object number five, he's basically halfway. I see only half of it. So, if I wanted to get a, an, an idea about the uh, area of the particles, it would be unfair to include such data sets because I'm actually not seeing the full object. Okay. Again, <clears throat> this is extremely versatile. Just feel free to play with this. It, it's extremely powerful, extremely useful. And again, don't forget that as this creates these ROI, uh, these ROIs which, oops, I'm over here. I can now go always back to my original file, which I accidentally closed. So let me just open it again. And just see what I've been detecting. Okay? Any questions? I am not seeing any questions. Fantastic. Either I'm being very queer or people are just uh, bored. <laughs> But okay, let's assume everything is still going well. So one thing that, that is important for the challenge that we propose. So if I, if, uh, if I may remind you, 
the question that we have for you guys is, can you think of ways to actually try to make sense of these overlaps? So in here we have particles which are currently overlapping one another. So is there anything that we can uh, think of that could actually help us to uh, discern individual particles? So I'm not gonna give you the solution, but I'm just gonna point towards the one thing that you can do with the different ROIs. So one thing that you can do is actually, let me actually not use these. I'm actually gonna use the filtered one because the filter is a bit smoother. Okay. So one thing that you can do also with the ROI manager is that you can go, if you go into more, we have here the logical operators. So we have and, or, and uh, x, or. And again, if you go back to the beginning of our tutorial, these operations are extremely powerful. So one thing that you could do is you could try to find only the edges of the particles. So, uh, and this I can show you very easily how it can be done. So if I just uh, select my whole image and I go here and I just find edges. So this applies a kind of a Sobo filter we only, which only shows you really the edges of, of your particles. And now because I have like white objects, it should be easy to find with analyzed particles. So then, I have my ROIs from my edges, and then I have my ROIs from my center, from my bulk of my molecule, of my particle. I'm pretty sure you can think of oper logical operations to actually combine both or exclude both and get individualized nuclei. But again, this is up to you guys to think about. So, when, so I tried to go through the same sequence of rationale as Alex did. Uh, one thing that, uh, I'll actually leave you with, and this is going to be for the next session, this is going to be a transition for the next session, excuse me, is um, so far we'll be dealing with 2D arrays. This is a 2D array, a 2D image. But as you probably are aware, I mean, we can do 3D arrays, we can do multiple dimensions, uh, acquisitions at the microscopes. And the tools that we are providing you today also work on those uh, different arrays. So I just open an example regarding that. So I'm gonna close this window and this window, and I'm gonna close this. And I'm gonna delete, of course, I'm gonna delete this. So let's go to file, open samples, and let's go for the MRI stack. So as you can see here, I have now uh, an MRI stack. I'm gonna duplicate this, so I'm gonna to go to image, uh, again, duplicate. So I have a copy in case something goes wrong. And as you go, again, uh, what Fiji allows you to do is actually see here that, again, we have no uh, information about the real size of this of this brain. But I do know that there are, this is image number one of 27. And if I scroll down here, I can actually go through my stack of images. And you can actually see how the whole brain looks like, okay? I'm gonna to try to do a bit faster, you can actually get, get the idea of how this works. Now, if I want to segment basically the area of my brain throughout the different sections, is there a way to do that? Yes, there is. So we just do the same things that we did before. So I'm gonna use this guy and I'm gonna to try to start by doing uh, a median, let's go for median instead of Gaussian blur. So you see that this becomes a bit uh, more blurry. And I'm going to process all 27 images. So now you see that I have my board image throughout. And now I'm going to threshold this image. And now, as you can see, we have a dark background. So we're going to select, yes, I do have a dark background. And I could look for the best, uh, the best um, thresholding method. Again, this is something that you can visually inspect, see what, which one actually best suits your needs. And I'll say that probably I, I like to use, in this case, the triangle. Again, feel free to play with these. And if I apply this, he's gonna ask me, okay, you're applying the triangle. This is, the background is dark. Should I calculate the threshold for each image? Yes, because again, if you apply a threshold based on this plane, this might be erroneous for the future slide, for the future images on the stack. So yes, calculate every single threshold. And again, just do that. Okay, so now I have a black and white image as we did before. You can see. And now what you can do, you can just go back to analyze, analyze particles. Let's not do any exclusion. Let's just do zero to infinity. And let's include holes. So I want to cover these holes. So I'm going to include holes. 
of the process of the twenty seven images. And now you can basically see how the area of your brain changes through each image. So I have twenty seven measurements, which means I detected a single ROI per image. Right? You can see that as I scroll, I'm getting all the different uh, ROIs. And the measurements tells me that, okay, in terms of area, you have a 27, 28,000 uh, pixel square uh, area. Again, we have talked about pixel square because we don't have information about the real size of this brain. Okay? Uh, so, the Fiji works with uh, not only 2D arrays, 3D arrays, 4D arrays, 5D, 6D. You can put any single dimension that you want to, into this program. Uh, it creates the, what we call, what we so call hyperstacks. And this is something that can be very useful, especially if you're doing live microscopy, when you're doing different channels, uh, if you're applying volume, if you're applying different uh, positions, if you're applying different uh, images within the same slide. Uh, Fiji can all understand all these things, okay? And one thing that I also like to leave you with, because again, uh, I always like to go into tangents. Uh, how do you visualize this? I mean, this is nice to, to actually play, but if I want to get the cross section of my, uh, like of my brain, how do I do that? You can go to uh, image, stacks, orthogonal views. And now you see that as I move along my cursor throughout my image, you see that this is my X, Z profile and my Y, Z profile. So imagine you're cutting the cake along this line, and now you're looking at it from the side. So this would be what this image would look like. And if I play with the with this angle here, you can see that I'm actually going through the, the current slice and I'm actually imaging in the X, Y vision. Okay. So this can be very useful if you want to get an idea about the volume or how your samples look like in terms of Z. Um, and again, there are many things that we can do with Fiji. Uh, I'm running out of time, I think, so I'm going to stop here. But any questions or comments, feel free to send them over to us or send us contact us by email. They will be glad to answer your questions. And I think that's all. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Joao. And I'll just um, talk a little bit. And if any questions come in, feel free to put them in and we can um, get those cleared up now. Um, but the, the 3D imaging would also work great for PFIB. Um, samples that you're getting, um, where you're getting some 3D SEM data as well, even EELS um, data that we can get. So as Joao mentioned, the next session, we'll be looking at how we can work with 3D and not just 2D data sets. And we'll also be taking up the homework where just the thought experiment for you to figure out um, how you might separate overlapping particles so you can perform some significant measurements on them that will actually help you um, with your own data sets.